It's an old palace, it's a baroque palace called Palazzo Pariso, just in the main square. It's, it's of Nasha, just like an oasis um, in this urban town because as you go in, you immediately realize that you're entering a very grand, kind of elegant place with a staircase that takes you up into rooms which were basically taken um, even as um, a set for the movie um, uh, The Count of Monte Cristo. And uh, so it's, it's definitely over the top for some people, but it's a very elegant, baroque, gilded rooms upstairs with a beautiful terrace overlooking a beautiful garden. Yeah, you can have um, coffees, you can have also meals for lunch, um, light, light meals, but also in the evening it's opened up for, as a rest restaurant, really. Um, Nashar is full of these little lanes which are beautifully decorated with plants everywhere and you can go into a lane and you lose yourself in them and in one of the lanes not very far from Palazzo Pariso is a, is a beautiful cafe of Maltese food and and it's an old house converted into a cafe and it's a place where I sometimes I take um, friends of mine just to be private over a glass of wine and some nibblies like um, jbeinit, the ghost cheese and olives, stuffed olives and Maltese bread with stira. Um, you can just sit there for hours and you're, uh, it's, it's not a huge place, so it's a very intimate place again. It's shaded, thick walls and um, and you just stay there talking privately, whatever. It's a, it's a very uh, rustic, but at the same time really well converted into a modern kind of bar, wine bar. For us, for us Maltese, when I have um, friends coming over uh, from different countries, especially from England, and I take them to Republic Street for the first time, they feel completely overwhelmed. Overwhelmed with all senses, like noise and sight. Sometimes there's these Festa Bandalori along Republic Street and the different kind of architecture. But mainly they feel fascinated by seeing Maltese talking because it's not the first time they look at me and they say, what are they arguing about? And 99% they would just be greeting each other, really. But uh, the way we talk, the way how we kind of um, articulate our emotions, uh, sometimes for the outsider looking in, they experience them as being a bit aggressive but it's a trait that we have and I think it's part of it is the passion that we have. But one of my favorite places of culture is, is the Manuel, Manuel Theatre actually. Um, it's a very intimate uh, theatre in the middle of a letter uh, built by the Knights as we know and built for the Knights to um, to entertain the knights and the people. The, um, the Manuel Theatre had uh, different uses, um, other uses, um, along the years, um, especially when the main opera house was built in Valletta. Um, it lost a lot of its importance, the Manuel Theatre. Um, it has come back in, onto the scene once we lost the opera house. Um, because it's the only theatre that we have. It's one of the oldest in Europe. It's 17th century, um, oldest in use. The, the beauty of the theatre, it's, it's intimacy, first and foremost, because it's not big, it's, it's small, but also the beauty and the simplicity of its design. Um, underneath the theatre is a well, and it was uh, built in order to give the acoustics 
um, to the theatre. Some of you might know as well that uh, the famous anthropologist Desmond Morris lived on Malta in the 1960s. Um, he chose Malta because he found it very stimulating and inspiring to explore difference in human behaviour and also uh, in regards language, especially body language. And Malta gave him the inspiration as well to, to write Men Watching. Apart from some differences he had, especially with um, the conservative Catholic Church at the time, he had some tension with it. But apart from that, his, uh, he, loved, he loved the island and he, he found a lot of good things to say about it. And I'm going to read part of it, part of his book, his um, biography. For a sun-starved Englishman, the Maltese climate was a revelation. Eating at a stone table in the garden on freshly caught fish bought from the morning market, it was possible to reach up, pick a lemon, cut it and squeeze without moving more than a few feet. Bunches of grapes hung down over the table and a distinction that I had never made before dawned on me. In England, I had always eaten that fruit. Here, I was eating live fruit. The difference in fragrance and texture was such that I never forget it and never enjoyed dead fruit in the old way ever again. Saint Agatha was a Sicilian saint, a Sicilian woman, who dedicated her life to God and wanted to dedicate her life to God. But there was this kind of emperor in Sicily who wanted to take her. He wanted to seduce her. And she, according to the story, refused his advances. And he became more enraged and wanted her more. And he tortured her. And the torture was they cut off her both her abusion. She came to Malta to stay. And she stayed in the catacombs of St. Agatha below the chapel, the present chapel now. <clears throat> the catacombs themselves are amazing. There, there are 12th century um, frescoes and also much earlier frescoes in the actual catacombs. Um, the chapel itself is more recent but it's old and the statue is medieval. Um, the statue has a story as everything and the statue, um, the story goes that Imdina was going to be attacked by the Arabs and there was this nun who had a vision and the vision told her take the statue of Saint Agatha on the fortifications of Imdina and the city would be spared and that's what they did they took the statue of St. Agatha, the same statue which is present in this chapel, and they put it on the bastions and the Arabs just fled. They were frightened of her and fled. And until to this day, every year, on the 5th of February, on the Feast of St. Agatha, the canons and the monsignors and the bishop from Medina process from Medina to St. Agatha's Chapel as a thanksgiving. Maltese is Semitic in its foundation. Um, historically, we got the language from the Phoenicians when they took over the island. And uh, there is a similarity even now, nowadays, listening to Lebanese, for example. Um, I can understand some of the words when they speak. And they can understand us when we speak. 
Through the years, there has been a lot of influences in the, in the language as well. So that's why there's Semitic influence, but also there's Romantic influence of Italian, mainly, and Sicilian. And it's because of our history, close history with, and geographically, closeness with um, Sicily and Italy.